All right, what's going on, everybody? This is End Time Headlines, and we've got a lot to cover on today's program. Today, we've got a doubleheader lined up for you. Of course, we're going to open up today. We're going to talk about this bridge collapse in Maryland, and then we're going to shift gears, and we're going to talk about a, a, how prophecy is accelerating in regards to the falling away of the church, and we're going to kind of do a little bit of a dissection on that and bring out some stuff that I want to show you today. So without further ado, let's get after it. The following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. All right, what's going on, everybody? This is End Time Headlines, news and headlines from a prophetic perspective. I am your host, Ricky Scaparo, the founder and the voice of End Time Headlines. And it is Tuesday, March the 26th. As I said on the opening of this, we've got a double header lined up for you today. Listen, before we get started, can you do me a favor? Hit that like button, hit that share button, hit that push notification and help us push this out so other individuals can uh, be alerted and, and see the program as well on these algorithms such as YouTube and Rumble and so forth. Of course, we want to welcome everybody to the broadcast. Everybody on Apple and Spotify, we welcome you. You guys on Rumble, you guys on YouTube, the chat Everybody that's listening and watching, whether it's live or by the rebroadcast of this, listen, if you're new, first time joining us, first time uh, being a part of our program, let us know in the comment section below that you are new and where you guys are joining us from. And real quick, want to get this out of the way real quick, and then we'll get right into the segment today. If you've not downloaded our free app, this is how you keep up with our ministry. Please do not rely on social media outlets uh, don't rely on them because there's so much suppression, so much censorship and shadow banning. If you go to your Play Store, depending on what you have, Apple, Android, go to your Play Store, look for End Time Headlines, type in the End Time Headlines, look for the ETH uh, trademark logo, download our app. You guys that are watching this by the visual, in the description of this video, there's a place that says download our free app. Just click on that link, whatever the case may be, download it. Hit yes to push notifications and you're going to be squared away and you're going to catch every headline and every podcast when it's readily available. All right. So by now, most of you guys <clears throat> are aware of the bridge collapse in Baltimore, Maryland. This happened in the wee hours of the night. I'm going to take you right into this. I got a little video clip here that we're going to watch together. And then I'm going to give you some insight into this from a a perspective that a lot of people are probably not talking about or covering today. So I want you to hang in here with this for a minute. Let's just get you up to par with what's going on here. Check it out. Here we go. You're not going to believe this. A massive emergency response is underway after this bridge in Baltimore collapsed earlier this morning. Did you see that? Stunning. The entire span of the Francis Scott Key Bridge came crashing down into the river after a container ship rammed a support beam, as you can see in the left-hand part of the screen. So firefighters say as many as 20 people are in the water, and it's being described as a mass casualty event, Kaylee. Now, according to the latest reports on this, I pulled this up. This is an article from the DailyMail.com. Doomed cargo ship Dolly was being piloted by a local crew, listen to this, who were trained to avoid obstacles in the Baltimore port. As it emerges, a 100,000-ton vessel lost control and propulsion. Again, I want to state that they lost control and propulsion moments before smashing into the bridge. Now, here's another video. It gives you a little bit more detail in this, and you can see in this video where the, the, the lights, the, the ship loses power, then it comes back on, then they lose it, and then they strike the actual bridge. Watch this. Check this out. So you can see it here on your screen. There goes the power. Power goes out. It's still moving forward, heading right to... Look at the cars, guys, on the bridge passing over. Has no clue what's about to happen. Lights come back on, and then it, like, literally feet away from the bridge, you see here comes more cars going through this bridge. You guys that are watching a visual of this, boom, lights go out again on the ship and then here comes the impact again this would be absolutely terrifying if you were on this bridge from the visual of these vehicles from their perspective and it's it's edging closer 
to the bridge, uh, to the pillar, the columns, they're holding up this bridge, and then wham, there it is. Slams into it, looks like, right there, and then there goes the bridge as it collapses. Now, here's some interesting things about this bridge. I'm going to pull this up now. Uh, here's This bridge is known as the Francis Scott Key Bridge, known originally as the Outer Harbor Crossing until it was renamed in 1976. This is uh, simply, it's known simply as the Key Bridge or Beltway Bridge. This is like a main artery bridge they're running through this area. Now, the bridge was named after, after Francis Scott Key, uh, he may sound familiar. Some of you guys may know this, may not know this, but he actually was the author of the text of the U.S. National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Now, why is this all interesting? Here's why it's interesting. This, the Star Spangled Banner, again, Francis Scott Key was the author of this, of the text of this National Anthem written in dur during the war of 1812 now for some of you if that that time frame 1812 sounds significant it's because it is now i want to put us i want to put a, a post up here for a moment i want to stop here because i want to bring you back something that i believe is very interesting that happened 24 hours prior to this event in baltimore maryland some of you may be aware of this some of you may not so within a 24-hour span, according to Reuters, Benjamin Netanyahu cancels Israeli delegation to the U.S. over U.N. Gaza vote. Look, check this out. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday said he will not send a delegation as planned to Washington. Look at this. After the U.S. refrained from vetoing a U.N. Security Council proposal calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. And it wasn't calling for a ceasefire. It, the UN Security Council, listen to me guys, was demanding, demanding a ceasefire from Israel. Here's another headline on this. Train wreck, Biden and Schumer putting the US-Israeli relations on a collision course. According to a report by Joel Rosenberg, and he is known in prophetic circles dealing with eschatology and end times, I want to read a little bit of this article from Charisma, where in which he shared that, <clears throat> quote, Biden is attacking Netanyahu behind closed doors with vulgar and obscene language, and the White House aides are leaking those the, these dialogues to the mainstream media. Biden, quote, is also demanding that Benjamin Netanyahu stopped prosecuting the war against Hamas, telling the prime minister in a phone call that, listen to this, he will not support Israel invading the city of Rafa, the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip and the last stronghold of Hamas leaders and terrorists. Quote, if this weren't bad enough, Schumer is publicly attacking Netanyahu as the main obstacle to peace. Uh, again, saying that Netanyahu has, quote, lost his way and calling for immediate elections in Israel to get rid of him. Stop. Guys, listen, you've heard me warn about this. I'm not the only voice out here warning about this, but you guys that are uh, regular listeners of our program and viewers on a week to week basis, you've, you've heard me say that when I see this kind of stuff and this kind of information and these kind of headlines, it absolutely terrifies me as an American because I understand a principle of Genesis chapter 12 where in which God made a covenant with the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, and he told Abraham, those who curse you shall, shall be cursed. Those who bless you shall be blessed. <clears throat> and there, listen, it, uh, America and all the nations that has ever tried to come and divide the nation of Israel, it has never gone well with them. In fact, there is a, a man who wrote an entire book about this subject. William Koenig, who authored the book Eye to Eye, Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel. This is an extraordinary research. And he goes into great detail about all these world leaders 
and U.S. presidents such as George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, all of these of which <clears throat> have in their, um, in their presidency pressured or called on Israel to divide their land. As a result of this, as a consequence of this, America suffered some of the costliest insurance events, costliest hurricanes, largest tornado outbreaks, and the quote-unquote perfect storms, and even terror events <clears throat> that has transpired within a 24 to 48 hour basis from the time of where in which leaders, listen to me, stood up and called for the division of Israel or <clears throat> or uh, reacted in a derogatory manner in where in which they were turned their back against Israel. So consequently, listen to me, consequently, the United States of America, now again, headed and spearheaded by President Joe Biden, who is the current president, setting president of the United States, refrained from vetoing, did not, let me explain what that means. He did not stand in or stand up for or support the nation of Israel. He is, guys, I could pull up other articles and reports where individuals, insiders, people are saying that Biden is turning his back against the nation of Israel. This is something that we have feared for a long time, and we've warned about this, because again, Zechariah warns that in the last days, that Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling. And he talks about the nations of the world would come against her to try to divide her. And they would find themselves fighting against God himself. And there would come swift judgment for it. So here we are 24 hours from the report of the U S turning their back against Israel, refusing to veto this, this collaboration of nations that are anti-Israel demanding that they, there be a ceasefire. And now we have this disaster unfold in America. Remember, I just told you there's a long track record. Guys, we could spend an hour and I could go through all these hurricanes and tornadoes and fires and disasters that were directly connected to that. For example, let me just give you a couple. In May of two, uh, somewhere around uh, it was in 2011. I want to say it was in May. President at that time, it was President Barack Obama. Got up, did a, uh, got up and addressed the nation, where in which he called for Israel to go back to the pre 1967 borders, which would ultimately he is calling for the division of Israel. Within a, within a 24 to 48 hour span of that time, a massive tornado, an EF5, ripped through Joplin, Missouri and caused catastrophic damage. Then, then only a few months after that, so the, the, the pressure kept going with Obama while he was president of trying to divide Israel. He kept bringing it up in conferences. He kept bringing it up in hearings. He kept bringing it up in conversations. And then uh, we fast forward. Again, this is in 2011. You go from May to August of 2011. And on August 23rd, 2011, a magnitude 5.8 earthquake struck 84 miles southwest of Washington, D.C. And as a, listen to this, as a result of that earthquake, the Washington Monument was damaged. So listen to me. So here we have, fast forward to 2024, we have Obama, uh, excuse me, we have Biden, who's turning his back against Israel. He re refuses to veto this, this uh collaboration of nations coming to demand Israel to, to, to demand a ceasefire behind the scenes, Biden and all of his administration is working to try to divide Israel and Jerusalem for land for peace. And then within 24 hours, we see in Baltimore, Maryland, a bridge collapses. They still don't know why they still don't know how they're saying it wasn't terrorism, but they can't figure out how this happened. And consequently, the name of the bridge was Francis Scott Key Bridge, named after an individual who wrote the Star Spangled Banner in 1812 
And again, if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because in 1812, there was what was called the War of 1812. And this war was a conflict between the United States and Great Britain. This is the war in which ultimately ended up in Washington being overrun by Britain and they set fire to the White House. Are you kidding me? And listen, also, consequently, this is also the same time frame where in which it was the last time that a comet was seen in the heavens in our solar system that was visible to the to our eye here on earth in 1812 you've heard us talk about this in other in the other podcasts this is the same comet guys that has come back now and is now visible in the sky and they're calling this thing this devil comet with horns and it's going to be at its its brightest peak on April 8th, which so happens to be the same time frame as this solar eclipse. Oh, but I'm sure it's all just a coincidence, right? So guys, I wanted to, uh, listen, I wanted to take the first half of this program uh, because I knew I wanted to talk about this. This is crucial for us as the church to continue to pray for our nation. Again, I want you to think about this, guys. I just showed you that there's a history of disasters linked to the attempted division of Israel and the derogatory treatment of the nation of Israel. Again, based on Genesis chapter 12, and there's a whole history of that. And now we have this bridge that's linked to a man who wrote Star Spangled Banner in the same time frame as the U.S. was in a war in 1812 with Britain where the, where uh, where monuments in Washington, including the White House, was burned and we have a comet in the solar system that is resurfaced from the same time frame where in which it was in the heavens for a full year during the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes that broke loose in America. I'm telling you, listen, I know we'll get it, we'll get kicked back on this. Every, when we start talking about this stuff, all the replacement theologists don't like this. They think we're nuts. They think we're uh, we're we're preaching hyperbole and all this stuff. That's okay. I'm I, listen. I'll put on my big boy pants. I'll take it. Cause I we're I am a watchman. I see things like this, and I don't believe in coincidences when it comes to stuff like this. So I wanted to inform you guys. I want you to get this out there. Listen, again, hit the like button, hit the share button, invite people in. Let them know, listen, that we have got to pray for our nation. If we don't have a move of God, if we don't have a national revival, a national waking, a reprieve from the Lord, I'm telling you, the judgments that I believe we're already under is only going to intensify. You go to Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus, Levitic, Leviticus 26, excuse me, when God starts talking to nations about those who turn from God and they begin to turn into idolatry and all this stuff, he says that he will bring this and allow this to come and that to come. And then he says, if you don't repent, I'll bring seven times more upon you. So, guys, I cringe to think what is going to happen. Again, the, the heavens are sounding the alarm. God is sending great and fearful sights from heaven upon the earth. There's distress of nations. There's perplexity. There's things happening everywhere. And again, you have to wonder, are we getting it? Now, that's the first half of this message. We're going to, at the end of this segment, we're going to pray specifically for America. OK, we're going to pray hard for America and pray for I know you, if you don't like him, it don't matter. But we are commanded, according to the word of God, to pray for people of positions of authority. That includes President Joe Biden. We got to pray for him, pray for his administration. Why? Because the guys, our very lives are at stake. Our country's at, say, at stake here. All right. Now I want to move on to the second half of this program. And I want to talk about, there was a new report that says, quote, church attendance has declined 
and most of the U.S. religious groups. Now, this is, and I would venture to say that it continues to decline because this is not something that just happened overnight. We've, we've done all the polls. We've done these research that's been done, and we've talked about this over the last four years, and this is an ongoing trend, again, of church attendance declining not just in Christianity, not just in Protestant Christianity, not just in uh, in that arena, but in every religious group. According to the report, only three in 10 Americans now say they attend religious services every week or almost every week, while 11% report attending about once a month and 56% seldom ever attend and then a whopping 31% say they never attend. Now we can get on here today and we could delve into theories. Why? Is it this? Is it that? I'm going to tell you, I believe with all my heart, one of the main reasons why people are turning away from organized religion, they're leaving the brick and mortar traditional churches is because what they have become. And now I make this assessment. I make this assessment based on my ear to the ground, what I see in, in comments on Facebook, social media, uh, platforms, what I'm hearing uh, on the ground from other individuals, people I know personally, what they've experienced themselves on a, on a, on a firsthand basis, what they've seen with their own eyes. Listen to me. I believe the, a, a large assessment of this, or a large reasoning for this is because churches have strayed and went so far off the mark on what their beliefs are, what their doctrine is, what their teaching is, what the, the preaching of the quote unquote, the gospel contains and what it is and what it consists of. We, they have veered off course and went off rails so much that people are not attending church anymore because they recognize when they open this Bible, that what they're seeing and what they're experiencing is not lining up with this. Let me give you an example. Here we go right here. Let's Look, let's just go ahead and flip over the tables right now. If, if this, listen, if you have not been offended all week by end time headlines, you're going to get offended by this probably, by this next statement. I'd say 95% of all churches in your city, in your region, are celebrating Easter, which, by the way, has its origin in ancient pagan ritual and celebrations of the spring equinox. Listen, Easter in itself began again. It was birthed as a, it was birthed and celebrated as a pagan festival celebrating spring in the Northern hemisphere. This was long before the advent of Christianity. And then we, this is why you have the Easter bunny, you have eggs. Again, it's all representation of the sexual fertility goddess that's why, listen, rabbits, bunny rabbits, all of that is uh, mixed up in with that, the origins of that. Why do you think the Playboy bunny, the Playboy industry is one of the most sexually explicit industries out there, come on, and, and is responsible for all kinds of filth that is that has circulated in America and around the world, and it just so happens that their trademark logo is an Easter bunny, or it's a bunny rabbit. But look, here in America, again, I can't speak for outside of America, because I've never been outside of America, but here in America, again, over 95% of the churches that you and I will visit on quote-unquote Easter Sunday will have Easter egg hunts for the kids, they will emphasize all this stuff, all this emphasis of Easter. And again, it has nothing to do with the gospel. The same with Christmas. Come on, Christmas, Easter, all these things. We've incorporated these things into the house of God. Now, again, is that the reason why all of these people are leaving the church? No. But is it one? It, sure. Because once the 
Listen, once the once your eyes open up to this stuff, once God lifts the veil off of these things and you can begin to have discernment and understanding of these things, it changes your whole perspective on this stuff. So here's the problem I have. And again, I'm, I'm using the example of Easter because we're coming up on that. So this is a familiarity thing here. So you've got churches out there that, listen to me, have no problem with promoting Easter services. We're going to have a helicopter come and we're going to drop thousands of eggs on, on this day. And we want you to bring your kids, bring your basket. They're going to go out there and they're going to collect tens of thousands of eggs. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt. We're going to have the, some churches even have the Easter bunny in the church where the kids can go after service and sit in the Easter bunny's lap and get chocolates and get treats from the Easter bunny. Same with Christmas. We're going to bring Santa Claus into the church and he, they're going to sit on Santa's lap and do all this stuff. So they have no problem promoting that as bait. Oh, this will get people into the church. Oh, I, we're going to use all this stuff to entice people to come to the church. But you've got churches that will refrain from speaking about what Passover really was. Because see, listen, we commemorate Passover. We do not commemorate Easter. Now, I say we as in me and for me and my house. I don't know what you do. But we don't commemorate Easter. We commemorate Passover. Passover is in the Bible. Easter is not. The disciples commemorated Passover. They did not commemorate Easter. They, there was nothing. They had nothing to do with bunnies and uh, and Easter egg baskets and Easter egg hunts. None of that stuff was in the early church and in, in early church history or in your Bible. That's all paganism. So here's where I have a problem. We have no problem enticing people and baiting them with all the theatrics and, 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 the, and the celebrations and the festivities and the food and the egg hunts and the, the helicopter <clears throat> dumping out all the eggs and Santa Claus is coming to our church and we're going to have Halloween right in the sanctuary and give out all this stuff. But here's where I have a problem. When it comes to the, uh, you know what we actually commemorate during that time frame, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, Calvary, Golgotha, what he went through. Oh, no, no, no. We can't talk about that. We can't, we can't express that. We can't verbalize that. We can't even let that out of the bag whatsoever because that might be grossly offensive to anybody. And by the way, what I'm telling you about literally just happened to a very well-known mega church in North Carolina, pastored by Stephen Furtick called Elevation Church. Here's the report. Mega church causes stir over Easter invites. What is this about? According to the report, digital content creator, I would show you the podcast, but they'll probably try to listen. These churches, if you call them out on this stuff, they'll try, they'll, they'll do a strike against you on YouTube to try to come against you. So we ain't going that route. So it's out there. You can look it up. We post it on intimidelines.org, intimidelines.com. We've got the clip embedded in the article, so you can go and watch the video yourself. But digital content creator Nikki Sharir explained in an interview with Pro Church Tools, listen to this, why the church, obviously she's talking about their church, Elevation Church, listen to this, will not be using key phrases like the blood of Jesus, resurrection, or Calvary on their Easter invites. Let's read on. Quote, for us, the most important thing on Easter is inviting people to church. That's the most important thing. Not to hear about the blood, not to hear about Calvary, not to hear about resurrection, but just get them in the church. She went on to say that Easter and Christmas are the only two Sundays of the year that actually are wrapped around a particular passage in the Bible. Okay, really? Easter and Christmas are the only two wrapped around a passage in the Bible. Again, Christmas and Easter. Really, First of all, oh, don't get mad at me here. Please don't, uns don't unsubscribe, don't unfollow, but I'm going to give you the truth. Brother Rick is going to give you the truth. It was very likely, I hate to burst your bubble, that Jesus was not born on December 25th. In fact, he was probably born right around the Feast of Tabernacles, somewhere around in September. So when we celebrate Christmas with Santa Claus and the, the reindeer 
and the uh, and all of this stuff has nothing to do with Christ. She went on to explain that these events are are tied directly to the mission of the church. Therefore, she says, when she thinks of these events, she thinks of them in light of talking to someone who does not regularly attend church. Talking all the way from people who've been in our church for years, and I want them to invite people to church, all the way to people who've never heard of our church before, and trying to get them to come to church. Notice she says, trying to get them to come to our church, never heard of our church, the church, get them to come to church. How about, listen, what if we focused on trying to get them to hear the gospel? Because the last time I checked, it's not your church that saves people. It's the gospel that saves them. It's G come on. It's faith in Christ. It's salvation in Christ. It's through the blood of Jesus. You know, the thing that you don't want to talk about on your flyers that gets us into heaven. She went on to say that, how do I talk to these unchurched people? How do I talk to those people who are really different? She went on to say that most of her focus and energy has been placed on reaching those who are far from God. So let's look at this strategy. Quote, I'm not going to say the word Calvary. I'm not going to say the word resurrection. And I'm not going to say the blood of Jesus. She went on to say that, quote, I'm not going to say any of these words that make someone feel like an outsider. Translation, I'm not going to say anything that makes them uncomfortable, that could be offensive to them. She went on to say that, no, oh, I got to pull this up. I want you to see this quote here, because again, it's all there. You can, I'm not saying anything that she didn't say. Ashir went on to say that, it, quote, it is important for letting people feel welcomed in the church. She went on to say that anyone can be a part of our church. It's again, it's all church, our church, church, church. It might not be for everyone. Everyone might not like it, but anyone can come. Again, I don't have a problem with that. The church should be open to everybody, but what you give them, what you present to them, what you teach them and what you preach to them should be found in this word and it should not be centered around something I want to talk about right now. And that is the very epitome of, of seeker sensitive and seeker friendly churches. What is this? You, when you, you've heard me talk about this seeker sensitive, seeker friendly, the seeker sensitive, seeker friendly movement that's been going on for a long time now claims that millions of conversions commands vast resources and continues to gain popularity. It seems to be attracting millions of quote unquote unchurched people into its, into the church. So again, let me say that again. This movement is all about getting people into the church. The intent of this movement is to get the unsaved individual into your church and where in which they can experience a, a most comfortable, inviting, and non-threatening atmosphere as possible. The hope is that the individual will believe in the gospel. So these church leaders and these churches will go through any measure whatsoever to keep these people comfortable, inviting, and non-threatening as possible. So they'll have theatrics, they'll have musical entertainment, all of this stuff. They'll have coffee shops, they'll have, you can buy, you can purchase this, this, everything to keep them coming. State-of-the-art technology, lighting, sound system, all of this stuff. It, it, again, it comforts the seeker sensitive individuals. You have state of the art nurseries, daycares, adult cake daycare, community programs, sporting teams. And typically in these seeker sensitive, seeker friendly churches, they keep their sermons 20 minutes or less. No more right around the 20 minute mark. And it's usually typically focused around self-improvement. You will discover that it is very rare that you will hear the preaching of sin, hell, or repentance ever mentioned. In fact, you, you won't even hear most of the time that Jesus is the, is the exclusive way to heaven. And it's, it's rarely mentioned in these type of churches. So the whole mentality of this um, if you build it, they will come. It's to fill up seats with warm hind ends and it's trying to build these empires. Again, guys, I'm telling you, this is not the gospel. The whole premise of this and the whole premise of the seeker friendly movement 
is all based on this concept that if you just believe in Jesus, he's going to make your life better. Relationship with your spouse will be better. You're, you will prosper. You will never get sick. You will never have any troubles. And your life is going to be dandy and great. And you can make every day like a Friday. So the whole movement is catered around keeping sinners comfortable. Now, listen, I, I know as well as I talk about this, we've already had kickback on this when we shared this report about uh, Elevation Church. And, and, and this is what the people's argument was. Well, that's just the invite. They didn't mention in the blood of Jesus or Calvary or resurrection the invite, but who's to say they won't mention it in the church? Listen, friend, if you are tippy-toeing around trying to keep somebody from being offended from your invite, I find it hard to believe that once they step into the four walls of your church, that you're really going to preach the whole gospel. And listen, don't even get me started on these mega churches because we ain't even got, we're, we're, we still got another part of this. And I'm not saying every mega church is bad, but I'm telling you guys that what, if, not, what are we, what is the focus on this, this segment that we're talking about on the latter part of this segment? We're talking about why are people abandoning the brick and mortar church? Because they're tired of hearing everything else but the gospel. They're, they're not hearing the gospel anymore. They're hearing self-help motivation messages. They're hearing glorified seminars that are humanism. There's come on. I don't, I'm going to say it anyway. I don't care. You can get mad at me, but they're tired. Listen, the Joel Osteens are not cutting it anymore. Christian television, which is full of this stuff, is not cutting it for them anymore. Christian television is full of this stuff because it's a supply and demand uh, order. Whatever the people demand, that's what these Christian televisions are going to supply. They're bowing their knee to the, to the, to the, the bell of mammon in this hour. Whatever's going to get us the views, whatever's going to get in the money, whatever's going to get in the support, it don't matter if their doctrine's wrong, their theology's wrong, they're preaching heresy, it don't matter. This, again, it is frustrating beyond belief, so I understand why people are banning the brick and mortar churches today. Listen, here's another article. This one was ridiculous, too. Here is a, an apologist, William Lane Craig, who says, and I don't want to use this word because, I, 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 again, I understand where we're at in the community. We want to try to get this, view, this message out there. You guys that are watching this, you can see it, but I'm going to use another term. William Lane Craig says, the shedding of innocent blood does no harm to babies, and it actually confers a great good upon them. This is a Christian apologist. According to this report, in a recent discussion with atheist Alex O'Connor, Christian apologist William Lane Craig suggested that, again, the act of shedding of innocent blood that a woman can do, either through a procedure or through a pill, is not bad for babies, but rather confers a great good upon them. That's what he said. Now, of course, his argument of this and his excuse for making this kind of outlandish statement was that they have an eternal soul and spirit, and they'll just go on and be in the presence of the Lord, so it's okay. You can just do whatever you want, basically. This, again, unbelievable. So you, do you see, friend, why people are losing their trust in these, these leaders and these people in positions of authority of the church. Listen, even the Catholic Church, guys, is in a, in a great shakeup right now. Look at this, article, or this uh, piece from Newsweek. Quote, Pope Francis faces growing revolt. Pope Francis is facing a growing dissent among members of the Catholic Church over recent decisions that opponents portray as contrary to tr traditional church doctrine. Even, guys, you know it's bad when it, they're, they're ready to throw the Pope out. Why? Because he's up there advocating things that are absolutely so far from the Bible that thank God these Catholics are waking up saying, uh-uh. This is, come on, this is an abomination. This is the shedding of innocent blood. We don't support these things in which you're telling us to support. The most controversial has been the publication of a document in December by a Vatican bishop with the Pope's approval 
mooting the possibility of blessing couples and irregular situations in same-sex couples. While the document stressed that it did not change the church's stance on homosexuality, it, it brought a joint letter from the Catholic clergy and scholars calling on others to disregard it. So this was the latest. This was almost like the straw that broke the camel's back for the Catholic church. Many of these individuals are done with this. They're finally opening their eyes and they're waking up. So it's not just the Protestants. It's not just, you know, the, the Christian evangelical charismatic Pentecostal circles. It's not just, uh, again, it's it's also the Catholics are, are, are having this awakening. I pray that the awakening comes to the Methodist church and the Presbyterian church and all these other denominations. But then we have this nonsense. We're going to watch this together. Look at here's the headline. This is from Inside Edition. Why do some mega church pastors not have to pay property taxes? Now, this is the whole work around the 501c3 nonprofit status. I'm not listen, I'm not against a, a per se a 501c3 nonprofit status, but I'm going to tell you as for me and our ministry, as for end time headlines. We are not a 501c3, and we made that abundantly clear many times on this program and other programs. And why did we do that? Because I don't want the government to have the ability to come in and dictate what I can and cannot say. We Listen, our ministry, we pay tithe and taxes on every dollar that comes in. Let me say that again. We pay, we pay, we render to Caesar to Caesar. And we pay tithes of every penny that comes into our ministry. We are not a 501c3. And what I'm about to show you guys is appalling and it's disgusting. I'm going to tell you right now. And again, you can unfollow us. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I've never been one that is intimidated by people's threats of unfollowing us. Because I believe the remnant that wants to hear the truth will remain. The, the, the people who like to have their ears tickled, they will depart. Here we go, check it out. They look like the homes of the rich and famous. Glamorous multi-million dollar mansions in stunning locations. Multi-million dollar mansions. I have a name in my house, La Maison de Reve. Hey guys, that was, let me rewind this. That right there, that man Jesse Duplantis is, is one of the most disgusting, just uh, the brazen, distaste that he comes out with the things that he says the boasting the pride and the arrogance and the things that he comes up with is absolutely astonishing it's unbelievable to me the amount of followers this th these people have like this so here's a guy he gets up behind the pulpit not preaching the gospel not talking about jesus but instead he wants to get up here and talk about how he named his house and wait till you hear the square footage of this house let me rewind this a little bit Check us out. Locations. I have a name in my house. La Maison de Reve. The house. There is his house. It's a dream. But movie stars don't live there. Are you financially independent like I am? I know what the heck I'm talking about. They're some of America's biggest megachurch pastors. Faith comes to a climax and produces. Like Kenneth and Copeland, who lives in this $6 million complex outside Dallas. $6 million complex. Why? Why? And again, who do you think paid for that? Oh, well, Brother Ricky, he earned that money. No, this was from people giving and supporting this. You may think that house is too big. I don't care what you think. You wanna know how big it is? Yeah. It's 40,000 square foot. And 40,000 square foot. Are you kidding me, guys? Who, why? Why does anyone need a 40,000 square foot home? I just, I, this is unbelievable to me. It's distasteful. I think it's, it's, it's very arrogant. And how he gets up there and he, he's just, there's such arrogance with this. But we, I've got scripture for this. Again, don't, don't listen, don't hang up yet. You got to remember the whole second half of this program. We're, listen, you asked, I asked you a question at the beginning of this. Why are people abandoning the church? Why are people not showing up to church anymore? They're tired of this stuff. They're tired of this stuff. Reverend Jesse DePlantis, who lives in this mega mansion outside New Orleans. I'm protected from recessions and depressions. This type of lavish lifestyle with private jets and sprawling estates has been spoofed in HBO's hit comedy series, The Righteous Gemstones. In other words, again, the world's laughing. 
Because this is the fa- that them people are being portrayed as the face of Christianity, the face of the charismatic movement, Pentecostals, whatever. And so they're now they're making a spoof about it. So the world's laughing at us. We get the blunt of that. So when an individual like myself gets up and tries to preach the real gospel, it's becoming an echo. It's falling on deaf ears because this stuff is become it's because such a reproach to the body of Christ. You should be ashamed of yourself. Well, I mean, they're just trying to get, grab as much money as they can. It's pure greed. Critics like Pete Evans of the televangelist watchdog group, the Trinity Foundation, say these preachers are using a legal way to avoid paying property taxes on their pricey homes. You and I are financing their rich lifestyles. Tax records show that each of the- I'm not. I don't know if you are, but I'm not. These mansions is owned by the preacher's churches, which qualifies them to be tax-free under the parsonage exemption. The parsonage tax exemption is a way for a church or religious organization to buy a piece of residential property, have their pastor live in it, and then not pay property taxes on that parsonage. It's essentially a way to make the pastor's life a little bit easier. And- which, is gr- which is good, guys. I grew up, or I, I shouldn't say I grew up, but when I got saved, when I was... 23 years of age in the year 2000, I went to a small country church in Kentucky where it was a church of God of prophecy and they had a parsonage where in which the pastor stayed in him and his wife. And they were, I love them to death. They were, they were great pastors uh, in that season of my life. And they lived in that parsonage and it was, and it was, it was a normal home and, and they deserved it. They, they lived very humble lives. They didn't boast like this. They didn't go around driving, you know, these, exuberant you know vehicles and extravagant lifestyles and all this stuff so again i don't have a problem with that but what they're saying here is these individuals are using this for dishonest gain they're contorting this and twisting this system for their advantage and live a little bit cheaper political scientist and pastor ryan burge believes the exemption should be used to help out pastors like jason fishburn who lives in a more modest home with his wife and family where they host church events everything from hosting gatherings to letting people come stay when they're in crisis, um, making meals for people out of your kitchen. It's the kind of job that really becomes more of a lifestyle in, in many ways. They say- Which is biblical. That, my friend, is the Bible blueprint. That is, I can find that in the scriptures. They what little money they save on their property taxes is crucial to help make ends meet. Things would be much tighter for us, for sure, without the exemption. But take a look at these mega church pastor examples. This home, owned by Redemption Church, where Pastor Ron Carpenter lives, is listed for sale on Redfin for almost $8 million. If you have a multi-million dollar house, your property tax bill could be thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. But if it's classified as a parsonage, now you don't have to pay property taxes on a parsonage. Really, an eight million dollar home, a parsonage, a forty thousand square foot home, a parsonage. D- does this make anyone sick to your stomach? It should. And again, this this is what's causing the distaste in, in people's mouths, and it's rip, it's repulsive to people. This is, and we wonder why we can't get people. To, to take Christianity seriously. We wonder why people won't come to the house of God. I'm just giving you examples, guys. Don't get mad. And listen, we'll get hate mail over this. I'll get people that'll message us in the comments and say that we're we're vengeful, that we're hateful, that we're judging, and they'll call us out on it when we're calling them out on it. And we're, we, I have the Bible to back this up, friend. Listen, I've got scripture. I'm just waiting to get through this video, and I'm going to give you some scripture on this. At home, That $50,000 could pay the salary of an elementary school teacher in your local public school. But according to tax records, the church paid no property taxes on it last year. Of course. Pastors Ivy and Bridget Hilliard live in this Spring, Texas complex owned by New Light Church World. When I fly to my home and I see it, I was just spread out and I look at all that God has blessed me with and I think I thought about walking off. I'm glad I press my way amen amen again this boasting on this i can again do you remember the scripture in the bible where it talks about this man he said he's he said what am i going to do with all this wealth 
my uh, I, I've got so much. He said, I'll just build my barns bigger so that I'll have more places to put all this stuff. And then you, this isn't a parable in the scripture. And God showed up and said, you fool, this night your soul is required of thee. What profit is it? for you to gain the whole world yet forfeit your soul. Records show it's worth $8 million, but they paid no property taxes last year. And this creature pad may be the biggest of all the parsonages in America. Look at the that. The mansion behind me is where Pastor Jesse DePlantis lives. It's located outside New Orleans, and he has said it cost about $20 million to build. And he often brags about all the valuable artwork inside, but records Records from last year show neither DePlantis nor his church paid a single cent in taxes on this property. I have the biggest house of any preacher in America. What? <sighs> Guys, and these people just sit there. They sit there and just love it. Oh, let me give you, pass that offering plate around, Brother DePlantis, so I can give you some more money. So you can put some more artwork up there that's exuberant and, and costs and that you can get up and brag about that some more. This uh, just unbelievable, guys, how gullible people are. I'm saying that on television. You don't think they're going to nail me next week when I get home. DePlantis didn't return our calls or emails, so we caught up with him in this Georgia church parking lot. We wanted to ask you if you're paying property taxes on your mansion in Louisiana. To me, those houses look of more course. like a fortress than an open door. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I don't know how a person could justify that being an extension of the church. Yeah, it's discouraging to see how far these guys have diverged from the teachings of Jesus. Well, drop the mic. That that pastor nailed it right there. Let me give you some script, scripture for this, and we're going to close this segment today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, and not greedy for money. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lust, which, listen to this, drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money. Again, not money. Money is not evil in itself because money can do good things for people. It can do good things for the poor, the needy, the widow, the orphans. It can do great things. But the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have, sh look at this, some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. Uh, in my opinion, guys, we just had a visual of that and they pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Guys, I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm telling you right now, we want to know why people are, are fleeing the church. It's because of that stuff right there. It's because of these things. We've turned it into a circus. We've turned it into theatrics. We're t we've turned it into a money changer's table. We, I mean, it's, it's, it's sick. It's unbelievable. But, you know, we look, I'm coming on here today, and I don't want you to be mad at God. I don't want you to get offended at Jesus. I don't want you to get offended at the ecclesy of the church because that representation is not the true representation of the true ecclesy in the church. There's a remnant out there, come on, that still believes in the gospel, that still preaches the gospel, that doesn't believe that we need all the theatrics. And we, come on, we still uphold the standard of Calvary, the blood of Jesus, and the resurrection that's listen if you don't if you if you can't preach teach and and talk about the blood calvary and the resurrection then you have no gospel without those three elements so we're going to listen you'll never have to worry about that here with our ministry we will continually preach on the blood we're going to talk about calvary and we're going to talk about the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ so i've come by here today to again to tell you now again why did we talk about this because this in itself guys is fulfilling prophecy 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said that before the Antichrist comes on the scene, before he invades the, the temple in Jerusalem, before you see all that stuff, he said the falling away of the church will transpire first, and we are right dab in the middle of it. We are seeing the falling away, the apostasia, the defection of truth, people turning from the truth and giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So guys, listen, I want to, we're going to close this program in just a moment, but I want to pray. We're going to pray. I told you we're going to pray for America and then we're going to pray for you individually. So let's pray right now. Come on, join me in prayer real quick. And then we're going to give you some announcements and we're going to let you go for this Tuesday and we'll see you guys back on Thursday. Father, we ask right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we lift up our president, our current, our current setting president, Brock, or, or excuse me, uh, Joe Biden, Lord, and have no doubt that Barack Obama is pulling strings behind the scenes. But nevertheless, this Biden administration, we lift them up right now and we ask that you would give them wisdom. You'd give them direction. I pray that, Father, they would not strike their hand against the nation of Israel because we know because according to the word of God, those who come against Israel, those who strike Israel, those who try to divide Israel and divide Jerusalem, Father, it does not turn out well for them. Lord, you said that we'll find ourselves fighting against you because you take covenant serious. You take the shedding of innocent blood seriously. You take abomination seriously. You take idolatry seriously. So, Father, I'm asking, Lord, in the name of Jesus, you'd guide every official, guide their hands, guide the administration, Lord. I pray that if they even attempt to try to divide the nation of Israel and Jerusalem, you would stop them by your mighty sovereign hand in Jesus' name. God, I'm asking that you would put a hedge of protection around your people God we are not directly involved in the division of Jerusalem and Israel as your people we are just here caught up in the middle of it and Lord I my heart grieves to think that innocent lives could be at stake over this but over a stroke of a pen or words that come and expressions that come out of press conferences and 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 these uh um and these addresses that come up on, on public platforms. So God, I pray that you'd protect your people, put a hedge about your people. We profess the blood of Jesus over our people. Lord, you said in Psalm 91 that we can dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, you said a thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it shall not come now our dwelling. We put our faith and trust not in our government, not in the White House, not in this administration, and not in a particular political party. Party. We put our trust and our faith in the Lord, our God. And we thank you for this in Jesus name. Now, Lord, I pray for every individual. If there's somebody watching today and listening today and you are a direct product of church hurt. You have been wounded by the church because of this stuff that we've talked about today. You've seen things behind the scenes. You've experienced things. You've been directly involved in things and it has wounded you. It has hurt you and it's even scarred you to the point where you don't want anything to do with the church anymore. You don't want to go back to a church, uh, a brick and mortar church or whatever the case would be. We don't want you offended at God, at the Holy Spirit and the ecclesia, of the real body of Christ. We ask right now, Father, I ask that you'd bring healing to these wounds Lord, in Jesus' name, heal their hearts. Let them see that there is still a remnant out there that still love people, that are still doing what God has called them to do. No one's perfect. We understand this. We know that everybody's going to have weaknesses and faults and imperfections. Nobody's got all their dots or their I's dotted and their T's crossed. But Lord, I pray that those of us who have a heart after you, who have the right intent and motive, that you would bless our ministries. And that they would prosper and reach as many people as possible in these last days. May this mighty net be cast and may we pull in these fish of all diversities and all sizes and shapes. And Lord, and leave it up to you to separate, come on, the bad fish from the good fish, the wheat from the tear, the sheep from the goat. And so, Lord, I thank you, Lord, as we continue to stand for righteousness and stand on the word of God. I pray that you would bless it accordingly. And Father, we give you praise, glory, and honor for these things in Jesus' name. Again, guys, endtimeheadlines.org, endtimeheadlines.com. 
That's where you're going to find our main website. Again, download our free app today, available on Apple and Android. Hit yes to push notifications. You're going to be squared away. Listen, guys, if this ministry blesses you, encourages you, equips you, this is your home church, whatever your relationship is with this ministry, we want you to pray about becoming a partner of our ministry. You can do that two different ways. You can give electronically through the app or through the main website, or you can give right there on your screen. You can make it out to End Time Headlines, P.O. Box 1391. That's going to be Monroe, Georgia, 30655. So again, we appreciate you taking the time to come out today uh, and, and jumping on to this broadcast. I know it was a lot. We covered a lot. Two, two uh, we did, um, we talked two talking points on this one session. So it went over a little bit over an hour. So I pray that you stuck around with this. But we're going to sign off for tonight. We'll be right back here Thursday night. We'll take off tomorrow, which is Wednesday the 27th. Be back 28th, Thursday night, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Same time, same place, same channel. Until then, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. And may his countenance shine upon you. We'll see you soon. Listen to me, friend. You need to clean out your ears and listen to what Brother Ricky's going to say here. When we- Thank you for listening to the End Time Headlines podcast. We pray that you've been blessed and equipped by today's message. For more information about how you can help partner with our ministry, please visit endtimeheadlines.org.